Futurecast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today and you are enjoying this holiday season. This is another special Wednesday morning episode brought to you by our sponsor, Jeremy Clevenger Fitness, who we featured on episode 145. If you haven't heard that episode yet, I encourage you to go back and take a listen, especially if you're struggling to get and stay in shape as a busy leader. I have another great show lined up for you today, but before we get started, I just want to remind you that it is the Christmas season, and I encourage you to consider giving the gift of leadership to the leaders and future leaders on your Christmas list. I've written three leadership books. I have the watch, you have the watch, and all in the same boat. And you can get all three books for less than $50 on Amazon or my website, johnsrenny.com. They make the perfect gift to have under your tree or to mail to the leaders in your life. So get your order in today to ensure delivery before Christmas. Also, I just wanted to mention that the Deep Leadership Podcast is now ranked in the top 2% most popular shows out of 3 million podcasts globally, according to Listen Score. And we are now ranked in the top 100 management podcasts in the U.S., according to Chartable. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for listening in every week and sharing these episodes with your friends. You have helped this podcast grow into a top-performing show. So thank you very much. Well, that is it. Today, we're going to be talking about mastering yourself. And my guest is Dr. Craig Dowden. Craig is a returning guest to the show, and his latest book, A Time to Lead, is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. In this book, Craig shows us how to master ourselves so we can master our world. Now, we've talked about self-leadership before on this podcast, but Craig helps us understand self-mastery. This was a powerful conversation that I know you'll get a tremendous value from. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by a returning guest and friend of the show, Dr. Craig Dowden. You might remember him from episode 135, where we talked about positive leadership. Craig is an inspiring and thought-provoking executive coach, Forbes author, and keynote speaker. He holds a doctorate in psychology with a concentration in business. He is also a certified positive psychology coach. Now, he has a new book out called A Time to Lead, Mastering Yourself So You Can Master Your World. Now, this book debuted on both on the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller lists, and I am excited to have Craig back on the show to talk about this new book. So, Craig, welcome back. Thanks so much, John. Absolute pleasure to be here. Love the first conversation and really looking forward to this one. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back, and congratulations on the success of this new book. I mean, I saw pictures of you in New York City, uh, you know, rolling out this book. How exciting! Uh, what's it been like this uh, launching the second book? Uh, it's been it's been amazing. The response has been really positive. Had some great feedback. Uh, very, feel incredibly fortunate, as you mentioned, to be in New York for the launch, and and now with the world opening or reopening, so to have the opportunity to connect with people in person and virtually like this, and uh, so it's just been absolutely wonderful. And and I think what uh, and a common uh, message that I hear from people is around their desire for leadership, and I love deep leadership. Leadership, right? <laughs> yes. and, it, and it's not that surface leadership, it's deeper leadership, it's much more connecting. And so to be a part of that conversation and valuable discussions like this one, that's just been uh, uh, wonderful for me. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's so good to see. And, and congratulations again. Uh, this, is, this is so exciting to have you back. Uh, the new book is called A Time to Lead. So tell us what's the big idea about this book? Well, the big idea, and, and I wrote it during the pandemic and uh, through the constant discussions I was having with clients and, and the CEO mastermind forums that I facilitate, was around the idea that great leadership starts with great self-leadership. Mm. And as we were navigating through the pandemic, people were asking questions around, so how are we going to get through this? 
And then as you really started to dig deeper, it was around how am I going to get through? Yeah, this? exactly. And how do I bring my team or my organization along? And so what I really wanted to do when writing this book was look at it through the lens of, so what are the key skills, the key qualities we need to possess in order to be strong self-leaders? And then once we're able to be more effective in mastering our inner world, well, then how can we apply that insight to support others in our care? Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's the big idea behind the book. I really like that. I know I talk a, a lot about uh, leading yourself first, and you've got to sort of make sure your own house is in order so that you can, you know, be there for, for all the others that depend on you. And uh, I had a friend of mine who say that it was like leadership is like being on stage, right? And we're, 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 we're present, you know, it's like we're being on stage, everyone's watching us. But if the back of our stage is a mess, right, then we can't concentrate fully on giving our best to the people that we're that we're serving. So it, interesting. So I do, do believe this idea of self-leadership is really important to, to be able to lead others. So I'm glad that you're tackling this issue. I think it's really, really, really critical. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, I, you know, I was looking at the book title and it caught my eye. It says mastering yourself, and that's two words. So that sounds intentional to me. What motivated you to frame it in that way? Yeah, and, and thank you for noticing. Um, and it was so the mastering yourself and so really wanted to separate those pieces because a really critical component of that. And I love that you talked about being on stage. It's almost observing ourselves from the balcony view. If you will. <laughs> yes. Being able to look outside because a lot of cases, you know, if we're looking through the world through our own eyes, well, then that may be a little bit of a biased view. We might have a bit of misperception about what the stage is like behind us. Right. So I love that you open with that, John. And so, you know, stepping back and, and examining ourselves and looking at the triggers and looking at what makes us tick, that's very important. And then I use the word mastering purposefully as well, because this is a continuous journey. Like throughout our entire lifespan, we are learning and growing and developing. So it isn't a, oh, yeah, tomorrow, great. I've mastered self-leadership <laughs> and I'm excited to go out and share with everyone else. Every single day, there are opportunities to learn and grow. And so that was really the purpose behind that, behind the framing of the subtitle. Now, that's interesting. I know, um, you know, I think about this a lot in terms of like those that have a fixed mindset and those that have a growth mindset. And I I think the leaders that that recognize that they that their work continues to, to work to improve themselves, they tend to be the better leaders. They tend to be a little more humble, a little more inquisitive, a little more curious. It's the ones that sort of, you know, say, I'm, you know, I'm set in my ways. This is, you know, I've been doing this for, for decades. Listen to me. I know the answers. Those are the ones that tend to get themselves in trouble, especially in a world where, where things are changing as much as they are. And you nailed it. Uh, absolutely. Is that the world is changing so fast. I mean, it was changing quickly pre COVID. COVID has put that on hyper fuel. Yeah. And the pace of change is just getting faster and faster and faster. And so operating assumptions that we had even a couple of months ago may no longer be relevant. And, and I love the point that you're making around. So if we're stuck in what worked before and hanging on to those legacy pieces uh, far past their due date, their expiration date, that really puts ourselves at risk as well as the teams and the organizations we lead. And so it's absolutely essential to say, okay, I can be informed by my past and absolutely, we can bring those experiences and extract lessons from them for sure. And now it's all right, so what else is out there? What additional yeah. data are in front of me right now? How can I tweak my primary operating system yes. and ensure that I keep getting those continual upgrades? Because otherwise, there may be a point where, you know what, what I'm trying to do right now, the world has moved beyond. Mm. And so continuing to look at situations as an opportunity to learn, to grow, what am I missing as opposed to, I've got this, get out of my way. Yeah. That's, that's the secret sauce for for leadership and success both now and in the future yeah oh absolutely i love that 
Uh, now, you uh, collaborated with the legendary CEO, Alan Mullaney, and uh, he was the former, uh, he's formerly of Ford and Boeing, and he was he was in, instrumental in the writing of this book. He said, each chapter, uh, you provide a masterclass, and you talk about the leadership qualities and how they apply to this working together management system that he has. Can you give us some examples of what those masterclasses look like in the, in these chapters? Sure. And and it was such a privilege to be able to connect with Alan and collaborate with Alan. And so when putting together a time to lead, one of the core operating frameworks that I wanted to, to come from was essentially have a masterclass in each chapter where a CEO or a very senior executive provided a case example of how these qualities applied in practice in, in their particular organization. And then when I had the great fortune of meeting Alan and having a conversation with him and and digging a little deeper, I talked to him about that I have a new book coming out. Uh, mm. We really aligned around leadership philosophy and leadership qualities and the being and doing of leadership. And I, I asked him, I said, would you mind being the, I would love for you to be the master class teacher because he's led two of the most globally yeah. recognized complex organizations in the world. So in each chapter, what he does is take an example or uh, such as mindset, as you talked about, John, and talk about how that applied within his working together management system, which he utilized for tremendous success within Boeing and as well as Ford uh, Motor Company. And so he will provide, he provides lots of great insights. So one such example, it's one of my favorites, is that he talks about the importance of you can't manage a secret. And I love that. Oh, framing so of true. It. So true. And and so in the working together management system, essentially, he had a progress chart where everybody had certain sets of responsibilities and projects and files they were they're working on. And so you had to report back every week, green, yellow, red. And so green, all systems go yellow mm, with a little bit of warning sign, but we kind of feel like we're going to continue to move forward. And then red was, uh oh, we have no idea. <laughs> like we're really lost at sea, if you will. And what he wanted to do was encourage a culture whereby reds were celebrated. And that's what, another awesome lesson from Alan, because Alan called reds gems. Because they allowed the secrets, right? Because in a lot of organizations, what do people do with the reds? Either minimize them or just don't talk about them. And then it's they have the potential to blow up. And so what I love about the work that he did was to celebrate and had so the first time when he went into Ford and someone stepped forward with a red on the progress chart, <laughs> Everyone was kind of, uh oh, like, is this, <laughs> is right. this a career ending move? Right. And yeah. what I love is, is that Alan, and he shared this with me, you know, he applauded in front of the entire senior executive team and said, thank you. This is exactly the type of transparent and bold leadership we need to turn things around. And you can imagine, John, how that set the stage for future conversations and how more reds came to the surface. And now let's figure out who can help us figure these things out and move forward together. So, so much phenomenal insight and how, and one of the things I love about Alan and his work is that sometimes, and this was part of a big part of my motivation as well, when you talk about leadership, people can say, well, you know, that's fine in these smaller organizations, or you're not a publicly, this wouldn't work in a publicly traded company or a global organization. And that's why I love having Alan instructing these masterclasses, because these are two of the largest, most complex organizations oh, yeah. in the world. So if these qualities apply there, it's pretty strong argument that, well, they can apply in any organization. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact that you're you're bringing the theory and the and the practitioner. And I, I always think that that's really powerful when we when we do that, because I think sometimes we get 
you know, too, too, too much in theory. In some cases we get too much in, in, uh, in practice. And I think we need to bring the two together. And I love how you're doing that with Alan, but I wanted to say that this, the, what he was talking about in terms of the, uh, the reds or gems. And, you know, what, in my book, I talked about running towards the fire that le leaders need to put out fires before they get bigger. And one of the things I noticed in my corporate career is that we typically were good news companies. Like the bads, the reds were hidden because of career preservation. Everybody wanted to maintain their jobs. Nobody wanted to get in trouble. So when there was a fire, no matter how small, everyone everyone ran from it instead of ran towards it. And I noticed that in corporate, everybody ran away. And I love that he said the reds are gems. Those are the little fires. We need to run towards the fire. And there's a great example of Alan being that kind of a leader who and uh, who elevates those and said, well, these are gems. These are opportunities for us to get better. And he's setting the stage, setting setting the, uh, the basically the way the culture is going to be going forward by how he you know, attacks problems and he, he celebrates them. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, hide them under the rug or people aren't afraid to bring them forward. Such powerful insight from such an experienced executive. I, I love hearing that. Yeah. Well, and, and you and I connect very passionately around that, as you say, theory and practice, the science, and then the application of that and it's why I enjoy our conversations so much. And I'm grateful for our connection, John. And then, and to your point, exactly. And I love your analogy right around running towards the fire, because well, if we don't address it, is it going to go away? Not at all. Oh, it's no. going to get bigger, as you say. And so, and that's what I love about Alan as well, is that, you know, it's about, hey, and there are going to be fires like, you know what, there's not a world. And I love how you described it as, you know, good news companies. It's all smiley faces and happy. Yeah. We're always on an upward trajectory. That's not life. That's not business. And yeah. we've got to have the maturity to be able to sit back and go, you know what, that's OK. Sometimes a fire is going to start. We want to figure out what have we done? <laughs> what? How might we have contributed? Is it a random fire? And it doesn't matter. Let's get in and figure this out before it becomes really perilous. So yeah. love your example. Yeah, absolutely. So you talk about the key qualities leaders need to possess to be successful. Uh, do these quali uh, qualities apply to everyone? Are they just leaders? What are some of these qualities? Yeah, uh, they apply to everyone, no matter where they are. And that was for me when constructing the seven qualities that I talk about. Uh, that was where I wanted to approach it. And and so the qualities are mastering our mindset, mastering our emotions, mastering our resilience mastering our strengths, mastering the art of receiving feedback, mm. difficult conversations, mastering difficult conversations, and then mastering authentic leadership. Mm. And each of these pieces uh, are, are fundamental in terms of how we lead our own lives, because we are all the CEOs of our own lives. And in fact, we are our chief financial officers and chief <laughs> operating officers and yes. chief marketing officers and on and on, chief information officer, on and on and on. And so when we look at it this way, how can we take those qualities and then apply it in whatever role that we that we fill? Mm. You you talk about resilience, and I was just want to touch on that one a little bit. Um, so you say that... Um, you know, it's important that we master resilience or be ma mastering our resilience. And, and of course, that's a hot topic now nowadays, right? We went through, you know, a lot of change in the past three to four years. So how do we master our, our, our resilience? How do we do that effectively? You're you're absolutely right, John, on this in terms of how much change. I mean, if anyone mm -hmm. asked, you know, before this started, could we envision this? <laughs> Not yeah. at all. The, the, the complexity of it and how long it's lasted and not surprisingly, resilience has been front and center. And certainly the ability to mat, you know, to more effectively be engaged in mastering our emotions and then the resiliency is, is front and center. And what I love, the Center for Creative Leadership to me provided one of the most powerful distinctions between pressure and stress. And so they define pressure as the extent of the demands that our external environment places on us. And then stress is our internal belief about our ability to deal with those demands. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that is pressure is external, stress is internal, right? And now it's around my confidence. And so the really powerful takeaway and some great insights that teams that I work with and organizations and my executive coaching clients is about 
Well, think about the areas in our lives where we feel stressed, right? Where we feel stressed and now start to look at it from a resource perspective and go, okay, what steps can I take? What resources can I draw on? Who can I lean on so I can increase my confidence that I can manage the pressure that I'm under right now? And so it's a very powerful model to remind ourselves around what it takes to be resilient. And then we can extend those insights to support our team members and to support our family members and our organizations, because the same question applies. In what areas of our, your life are you feeling stress? What resources do you need to obtain so that your confidence is increased, that you can manage this pressure that you're under? We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. This podcast is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger Fitness. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. But how do you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best person for the job. Now, don't struggle on your own. Put Jeremy Clevenger on your team. Jeremy will work with you to help take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. Now, I've worked with Jeremy for the past year, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So if you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at jeremyclevengerfitness.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. They live by a simple philosophy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. Because once you have the confidence, then you sort of like, okay, I got this, you know? And I think, you know, if you're in a leadership position, I think our people want us to see, I got this, you know, I, I've got I've got the support system, you know, maybe I don't have all the answers yet, but we're going to figure this out together. We're going to work through this together. I know for me, at least in the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't know what that was going to look like. I ran, I run a manufacturing company, so uh, we're going to go home. We can't work remotely. How are we going to figure this one out? You know, so it was really interesting. And and are we, uh, you know, are we a critical resource? Are we allowed to go back to work? And you know, so it's just a lot of open, a lot of questions, right? And a lot of stress, like you said, and a lot of pressure. And uh, but I, I like what you said is just sort of make sure you have the res- resources around that to be able to have that confidence to be able to lead in that scenario. For sure. And what I love about what you're sharing, John, is that so we want to be mindful of every single one of us loves to be challenged, right? Like the one of the vast majority of people love to be challenged a bit, right? And grow, stretch, get get a little out of our comfort zone. When we're overloaded, it's like, whoa, whoa, too much, too much. And so that's an important piece, right, is finding that sweet spot. And and I also really appreciate what you're sharing, because as leaders, people look to the CEO. Yeah. How am I supposed to behave under this circumstance? And I think, once again, a really powerful discussion that I had in multiple forums was around back to mastering our emotions, mastering our resilience is that it's OK to talk about the the gravity of the situation to share our emotions around it because that's a part of being authentic and being human yeah to your point though which i think is so important and i'm and i'm so grateful you shared it is that also at the same time it's not about 
basically dumping that responsibility on the teams and the organizations you lead. So you can say, hey, this is challenging and we're going through some tough periods and I have some concerns too. And we've got this. We've got the talent, the experience, Mm. the team around the table to figure this out. And I love how you frame that because that's an important piece, right? It's walking that important line around demonstrating I've got this. It doesn't take away from the reality of the situation. There's a fire over there and we can do deal with it together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. You know, it's like, uh, I always think of like, uh, you know, back on the submarine when we had, you know, heavy weather and bad storms and I was in a major storm in the North Atlantic in the winter and uh, you know, Everyone is just like, okay, this is bad. And we're all kind of looking to the captain, like, do you got this? Yeah, I hope you got this because we've never been in this situation before. I'm assuming you have. <laughs> so, but we look to our leaders, right? I mean, yes. in times of stress, we look to our leaders. And um, maybe we don't have all the answers, but we, we've we got to bring the team together, show confidence, and uh, and show resolve, and, and, and help guide the team through that difficult situation, even if when we don't have all the answers. Like with COVID, we did not have the answers. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I missed one. I want to talk, go back to it a little bit, but one, one of the ones you said it too is mastering uh, our mindset. Why is that critical? We talked a little bit about mindset earlier with growth versus fix, but in your, in your book, what do we talk about with, with respect to mindset? Well, and, and, and you really extracted the core lesson on that, John, around growth and fixed mm-hmm. mindset and the amazing work of Tw- Carol Dweck, one of the top respected yeah. psychologists of all time. And it was purposeful for opening the book with mindset it, because our mindset really impacts our reality. Yeah. So what our mindset is in a particular situa- and situation influences how we experience it. Great example we just talked about it was a beautiful segue, right? Pressure versus stress. Yeah. Whether or not I'm looking, and this is where two different people can quote unquote look the same, have the same resources, yet have an entirely different experience. One person feels they're underwater and the other person feels like, you know what? I've got this. Nothing different. They're in the same situation, have the same resources, yet different mindsets around this. And so I really wanted to open the book with that idea that, our mindset powerfully impacts what our reality is. The placebo effect, right? So much research around that. You give someone something that you say is going to help them out, and they often experience those benefits, even if it's a sugar pill, even if it's water, right? And so our mindset is fundamentally important. And then here's the other piece as well, because we can fluctuate between growth and fixed mindset. That's natural. It's part of being human. We want to maximize the time we spend in growth mode. And so one of the core, core ideas in the first two chapters, one on mindset and then following up with emotion, is that so what are our triggers? Mm. What are our mindset triggers? What are our emotional triggers that put us in growth mode or excited positive mode versus fixed mindset or negative, frustrated, disengaged mode. And the more aware we are of the types of people that trigger those adaptive and maladaptive reactions on our part, the more we're aware of the triggers that uh, that create an adaptive and maladaptive situational response, now not only am I more empowered in the moment, I can apply those learnings in the future, which is awesome. Yeah. And again, back to yourself, two words. It's stepping back and being more observational, almost like a Sherlock Holmes about who we are and what makes us tick. So now we can use that evidence <laughs> to solve our own case, the mystery of ourselves. Yeah, 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 that's good. I like what you said about the triggers. So I need to be thinking about that a little bit. I think I know what mine are, but uh, we, I think if you know what they are, and uh, then you then you can respond and not react in those situations if you if you prepare ahead of time versus just you know oh it hits you and you and you have your standard reaction. If if you know what your triggers are, you can plan ahead and you can respond instead of react. I think that's a valuable lesson from this book. And what I love is, and and again, such a great observation, John, is that you talk planning for preparing in advance, because mm-hmm. if we don't, that's what 
prevents us from capitalizing on that insight. Oh yeah, you know, I met my, you know, Sally or or Stephen, and then I I got upset today and and said <laughs> something or did something I shouldn't, and then I just go off. And then until I interact with them again or someone like them, and then I had the same reaction. So it's over and over and over again versus to your point going, wow, uh, Stephen really got under my skin today and got the best of me. And I didn't show up as my best self. And in fact, I really did some damage, not just to my own reputation, to what we're trying to achieve with this project. What am I going to take from that? And now what steps can I take in the future when I start to feel those sensations bubbling up? And to your point, it's that planning and preparation, because otherwise, guess what? We're emotional creatures. We're likely to be hijacked again unless we take the time to reflect and learn and then apply in the future. Yeah, I love that. That's such such powerful advice, such important advice. it's so important for every leader to know that and understand that and, and be able to apply that. Very, very good. Um, one thing you say is mastering the art of receiving feedback. Now, you didn't say giving feedback. You said receiving feedback. And this might be an area where I need to improve. So tell, tell us about that one. <laughs> well, uh, I'm I'm such a huge fan of Doug Stone. Uh, So he wrote the best-selling book, Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most. He wrote an amazing book called Thanks for the Feedback. And I was really inspired by his work in this space. And the reason I wrote it in this way is that it links back to the primary idea of the book. Great leadership starts with great self-leadership. Well, and what I find is fascinating is we often complain about how other people receive our feedback. And we don't take a moment to reflect on, well, how well do we receive it? And if I'm looking for other people to receive my feedback well, well, shouldn't I be really committed, equally if not more committed to mastering receiving feedback? And one of my favorite expressions is, take my advice because I won't use it anyways. (laughs) And it's such an important piece. So for me... The art, mastering the art of receiving feedback well, once again, you know, a core idea throughout our conversation uh, today is around triggers. Mm -hmm. So recognizing what are the triggers. And so sometimes as an example, we can react to feedback quite viscerally, a really strong emotional reaction. And oftentimes, the stronger our reaction, the closer that feedback is to our identity. Because if we feel our identity is threatened, right, I'm going to go to war on this. And it's important for us because this is a really powerful moment to learn because perhaps what I'm saying and doing is not having the impact that I desire. Mm. And so rather than reacting aggressively or defensively in this situation, it's critical once again to step back outside of ourself on the balcony and go, all right. Be more curious in this situation. Really understand where the other person is coming from. Because I always have the right at the end of the day to dismiss their feedback. I can choose to ignore it. Then, though, there are consequences to that. Because in the future, you know, well, why does John always do this and react that way? Well, if we ask the question, we can figure that stuff out. So for me, being really highly skilled and receiving feedback well not only benefits ourselves and the people around us, because they're probably going to give us feedback more often, it also empowers us to deliver more feedback effectively to other people, because we can model how that conversation can go. Yeah, yeah. I think with feedback, there's always truth, you know, and I think, like you said, it hits us harder when we know it's it's true, you know, and and, and we know and and so I think you're right. Our our emotions tend to blind us from being able to hear that truth. And and we've and if we can take the time to say there's a nugget here that's 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 truth and, and I and I need to work on. And if we can just sort of take it as like, okay, where's the where's the nugget in this one? And sort of put the emotion aside. Just where is the nugget in this one? Because that one hurt. <laughs> but yeah. but where, where, where is there a nugget that I can take and I can actually make a change to make to make it better? Well, I'm building on this. And and again, that's where mastering our emotions and mindset, that's the they're the foundational opening two chapters. And what I love about what you're sharing and and crediting Doug Stone and his work, because this was a mic drop 
discussion when he and I were speaking about this, where he shared, you know, Craig, a lot of times in the vast majority of cases, when we receive feedback, we go into like prosecutorial mode. Yes. And we're oh, looking yes. to poke holes, right? Yes. Like, and then if I can find one error, even if you shared 10 things, if I can find one thing wrong with it or slightly off, it's all gone. I'm going to throw right. the whole, I'm going to dismiss the whole case. And what he said, and again, building on your great insight, John, was that he shared, you know, rather than asking what's wrong with the feedback, we owe it to ourselves and the other person to ask what's right about this feedback. Mm. And I love that because it's such a, again, it's not our natural human tendency. We tend to, oh, I'm going to go into defense mode. Yeah. Step back and go, huh, what's right about that? Or if someone is saying that I'm coming across as argumentative, okay, how might that be? Like, what is, how might someone be perceiving my behavior, what I'm saying, how I'm carrying myself as argumentative? And I've had these fascinating discussions with my, my coaching clients where, again, and as a quick example, I'm sure you find it right in the work that you do, is around someone is passionate or angry. And depending on who's saying what, the person receiving the feed, well, I'm just passionate. The person giving the feed, well, you're angry. And they can be in the same spectrum right? Yeah. And the same experience. So being clear and understanding how, how that feedback can benefit us and to ensure we keep showing up as passionate as opposed to angry, vital. I love that. I, I love that. I think one of the things I talk about is complainers at, at, at work or employees that complain a lot. I think we tend to, a lot of people write them off and say, well, you know, they're they're just a pain, you know, but, but a lot of times, I found, in, you know, in doing this for three decades, is my biggest complainers. They 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 care and they want to see something done. And there's nuggets of wisdom in what they're saying. It's just that we, you know, they come off, you know, as a complainer, and you, you know, and we're trying to move the business forward. And here's here's somebody, you know, always, you know, complaining about something. But a lot of, oftentimes they 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 see something needs to be changed, and they and they and they, they maybe they're going about it the wrong way and trying to get the change. But there there are nuggets in there, and I think that uh, I've learned to listen to those complainers and and to sort of take time and go, okay, is there any truth in that? You know, uh, I love the example that you're providing because, and I'm going to link it back to a, a, a great point you made earlier around like good news organization. We can yeah. pro- we can use that mantra to good news feedback. Like we go to the people we like and get along with, yeah. how am I doing? And surprise, it's a mutual love in high fives, everybody's right. happy. And what I love about the research around feedback is, is it's the disagreeable people, the people who we have the most difficulty with, will likely give us the most honest appraisal. Yes. They don't particularly like us. So they're right. They don't have, they're not held back. Like you and I have a conversation. If we've created those expectations, we have that psychological safety and we're very purposeful in asking for that. Yet is someone going to voluntarily raise their hand, right? And so what I love is, is that the disagreeable people in our lives are the ones who are likely to give us the most unfiltered, versions mm-hmm. of ourselves and perhaps the richest data that we have to learn about ourselves because they're going to be less inhibited on the like the likability factor oh yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> absolutely i can think of stories in my heads of, of, of employees that didn't care for me <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's they spoke right. their mind and that's good and and they were always there right. was always nuggets in there and i think that's uh you know, so I say complainers are, let's, you know, hear them out. There may, there may be good reasons for their complaining. And and I, and I love that. And it fits with feedback too. This is really good, really powerful. Um, and I know we just sort of, you know, you know, scratch the surface of this great new book. Um, I really want to encourage people to, to find this book, get this book. It's called A Time to Lead. Craig, how can people find out this, where they can, where can they get the book? How can they find out more about you and your other books? Uh, well, and thank you. This has just been an absolute pleasure. And just like last time, the time flies by. Yes. I just thoroughly enjoy our conversation. I love your passion for leadership and positive leadership in particular. Uh, you can find the book on Amazon, Burns and Noble, uh, local bookstores. And then for me, uh, craigdowden.com is a great place to connect. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and I'd love, I love being part of a community of positive leaders. So 
reach out, uh, let me know that uh, John sent you and uh, love the opportunity to talk about uh, these topics, these ideas, because we are living in a time where leadership is desired and needed more so than ever before. And so to be able to be able to participate and contribute to communities of practice in that is just what gets me out of bed in the morning. So would love to connect with any and all of you on this. Outstanding. And we'll go ahead and put links in the show notes for those resources. Uh, Craig, thank you for coming back on the show and sharing uh, this new book and uh, all the lessons that you've got in there. Powerful stuff. And I encourage, again, listeners, check out his work. Good stuff. Uh, I really enjoy talking with Craig. Uh, he's He gets it. And uh, if you read his stuff, you're going to be a better leader. I guarantee it. So, Craig, thank you for coming back on the show and sharing this new book. Thanks so much, John. My absolute pleasure. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. If you're a working professional wondering what's next for your career, you've come to the right place. Whether you're looking for a promotion, growth, or a potential career transition, look no further. With over 30 years working in a variety of industries, I share my insider knowledge with those ready to get ahead on Career Advancement with Craig Ansell. Tune in to get your strategies for success. Miles, are you ready to record our promo for Season 2 of the Wanna Bet Podcast? David, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Miles, we're not here to quote lines from Airplane. We're here to tell people that Season 2 starts August 18th. But I like Airplane. I know you do, but Wanna Bet is a sports betting podcast. Each week we bet $1,000 on the NFL teams and games that we love. Well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric acid.